before we get started, I just need to make a couple disclaimers. The Portland Psychedelic Society is not a place to solicit substances or services. We are strictly educational, and that is the purpose of this meeting, to learn about Measure 109 and help us make an informed decision come November. Yeah, there is here right now, and I also am not seeing our frequent critics from from Facebook. I just want to clarify. Um, let's treat each other with respect and uh, and dignity and, and be kind to each other uh, during this Q&A and, and discussion. And uh, and thanks so much for everyone for being here. And Sam, uh, thanks also for, for showing up to to, uh, to inform us. I'm really excited for this. All righty, is that my cue, Evan? That's your cue. Thanks again, okay. Sam. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you, Evan. And thank you, everyone at the Portland Psychedelic Society. Again, um, my name is Sam Chapman. I use he, him, his pronouns. And I am the campaign manager for the psilocybin therapy campaign, also known as Measure 109. Uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I've been um, uh, here in Oregon the vast majority of my life, I think 24 years now. Um, I've been involved in almost every type of drug, progressive drug policy reform effort um, that's been around over the last decade um, from helping author medical cannabis um, legis legislation to advocating for um, safe uh, drug use facilities in Portland, um, safe injection facilities actually, um, to um, other types of advocacy. I got involved originally um, through an organization called Students for Sensible Drug Policy so um, in college, um, I did everything from educating students on how to deal with police encounters to what was very much more then than it is now, taboo drug education, such as what happens when you mix MDMA and alcohol together. Um, students for Sensible Drug Policy didn't condemn or condone drug use, but we did believe that it was um, something that people should have the, the right to choose. Everyone has the ability to put what they want in their bodies and if you're going to do that, it's our belief that you should be educated. So that's how I really got involved with drug policy. Um, and um, long story short, I'm very grateful to be able to work on this campaign um, and humbled to be able to work with so many people, many of which are probably on this call, uh, in creating the first state in the country that will allow statewide access to psilocybin therapy for those who seek it. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Um, I, uh, questions may come up during the presentation. I'm gonna admit that I'm, I'm just gonna focus on the presentation and then um, if you do have questions, feel free to leave them in the chat or ask them afterwards. It sounds like we're gonna have ample time um, to, to discuss. And so I, I look forward to um, answering questions, hearing concerns, um, thoughts, and anything else that may be on your mind resulting um, from uh, this presentation. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get this party on the road here. Let me move a couple of things. So you may or may not be aware, I'm just sure probably most people are, that here in America, we have a pretty big mental health crisis. And unfortunately, in Oregon, that crisis is especially acute. Uh, according to Mental Health America, we actually have the most severe mental health crisis in the country. And so that really is depression, anxiety, and different forms of substance um, abuse disorder. And so there's a lot of a lot of people that are hurting here in Oregon, especially for those where a lot of current medications have failed. There are certainly medications that work for some, uh, but we simply believe that there is an opportunity to provide new options where others have fallen short. And we believe that psilocybin therapy can be one of those options. So uh, I probably don't need to explain what psilocybin is to this crowd, but just for the disclaimer, psilocybin, the active uh, component naturally occurring in hundreds of different species of mushrooms around the world, many of which are obviously native here in the Pacific Northwest. And you may also uh, already be aware, but I'll say it anyways, uh, about the rigorous studies that have been going on at leading medical institutions across the country and around the world um, that have specifically shown that psilocybin may be uniquely effective in treating depression, end-of-life anxiety, and addiction, along with potentially many other things that are currently being studied as well. And in fact, psilocybin therapy has shown so much promise that recently the Food and Drug Administration has granted psilocybin therapy as a breakthrough therapy designation for both treatment-resistant depression and major depressive disorder. And so, um, you know, you may wonder, 
why, how does an FDA breakthrough therapy designation get designated? It doesn't get designated for everything. There's kind of two main factors that go into that designation. One, the safety pro profile that I'm sure many of us are very familiar with with psilocybin um, and that it is non-toxic and non-addictive. And while it can produce challenging uh, experiences, um, it's overall pretty safe, especially compared to a lot of the other alternatives, daily medications, anxiety, depression, medication, opioids, et cetera, that are on the market today. The second aspect that goes into that FDA um, breakthrough designation is that it may demonstrate substantial improvement above and beyond what is currently available. So um, some of the things that we really like to put forward, especially with folks who are not familiar with psilocybin, that really lend credibility to the science and the research that's going on today. So a little bit more about the measure. Our goal is fairly straightforward with Measure 109. It's to create a licensing and regulatory framework to serve those who seek psilocybin uh, therapy that can safely benefit from it, whether or not they have been diagnosed with a mental illness. Uh, and so that is a mental health illness. Uh, and so that is really one of the main components and differences, I would say, between our model and what is going on at the federal clinical trials right now. Um, we certainly would not be here today without those trials going on. We're in very much support of those trials. We just believe that people should not necessarily have to have a pre-qualifying condition to access psilocybin therapy. Whether you're suffering from depression, anxiety, addiction, what have you, um, or you're generally well off and you want to seek psilocybin therapy for your own personal uh, growth and wellness, you should be able to access it too, so long as you can show that you can safely access and benefit from psilocybin therapy. So here's a couple of things that our measure does. It establishes a regulatory framework within the Oregon Health Authority that will allow trained practitioners to administer psilocybin services at specially licensed centers. The measure also establishes an Oregon psilocybin advisory board that will be appointed by the governor. That will have 14 to 16 different individuals on it. Um, from doctors to therapists to researchers, um, basically, um, you know, an entire healthcare community, community members. Um, the only individuals that will not be permitted to be on that board are law enforcement. And that is not to say that there aren't people within law enforcement that are supportive. I can tell you that there are. Um, but historically speaking, uh, especially in my personal experience sitting on some of these boards, um, law enforcement tends to be a little bit behind the times. And so we do not feel like um, we needed to reserve a seat for them. Uh, and there will also be several subcommittees we imagine that will be created as well to talk about licensing and training, talk about equitable access and equitable licensing, uh, as well as many other different types of areas that are probably going to come up uh, within the two year rulemaking period that will commence after this law passes in November. So again, let me make that clear. Once this passes in November, there will not be any licenses that will be handed out until the two year development period has un, un, um, gone through and all of the details of the rules and regulations have been fleshed out. Some of the major items that will be discussed in that two year rulemaking period are what certifications, requirements, and training will be required for facilitators, producers, testing labs, uh, and service center providers. Um, and you know, there's gonna be numerous other conversations from what does a group therapy um, uh, type of situation look like, right? I think that's one of the ways in which we can attempt to um, lower the cost. Um, we know there will be a cost here and the campaign is not naive to say that, um, you know, we're not entirely sure whether or not insurance is going to cover this. We certainly hope so. And we're certainly reaching out to as many healthcare providers as we can to educate them on this program to one, let them know what's coming, but two, to help them understand the science and to help them understand how Oregonians really stand to benefit from having access to this and that health insurance should cover it. Again, we simply don't know yet. Time will tell. We need to simply pass this first in order to really have a deeper conversation about the insurance question, but it is certainly on the forefront of all of our minds on the campaign, as well as our supporters and people who stand to benefit as well. So um, there will also be a tracking system uh, for psilocybin products. Um, I think I generally covered the other part on the training and licensure aspect of that two year rulemaking period. And here's a little bit more uh, on the two year rulemaking period. So um, the first thing that will happen is the Oregon Health Authority will be mandated to compile all of the current research. Uh, it's imperative that, especially as a state agency where this is going to be very, very new for them, they have the facts and they have the science. 
Uh, it is not acceptable for the Oregon Health Authority to be basing things off of anecdotal evidence or um, from their own personal opinion. We've seen what's happened with other industries, specifically most recently cannabis, um, when the lack of information and decision makers decide to try and make regulations based on a lack of information. We do not want that to happen here. And so that is one of the reasons why first and foremost, they must compile and publish studies, research, and educational information for the general public. That is one of the numerous ways in which the Oregon Health Authority will be held accountable to the facts and the science. And so it's also going to require that the public continue to be involved in that rulemaking process. There will be numerous opportunities to provide public comment, to review and provide feedback on proposed rules and regulations. And so if you're someone that's interested in seeking services or being a licensed facilitator or service center operator, I very much encourage you to um, pay close attention to that rulemaking process. There's gonna be a lot of opportunities to be involved there. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so that basically is covered for the development period. So this is the three-step psilocybin services modality, one that I'm sure plenty of people here are more than familiar with. The first step being the preparation session. This is where a patient or client will sit down with a licensed facilitator um, to ensure that, you know, to do a risk and health assessment, right? So, um, you know, one of the things that, again, we're doing differently from the clinical trials is that instead of saying you have to fit within this box or this box, say anxiety or depression, we're simply saying, we're gonna turn that on its head and say, instead of saying you have to fit in a certain box, anyone who can show that they can safely access psilocybin therapy, which also means not be contraindicated, should have access to psilocybin therapy. So you may be wondering, okay, who is going to be defined as contraindicated? We did not feel comfortable defining that within the measure. That is something that the Oregon Health Authority and the advisory board will be taking up discussions between doctors and psychiatrists and people that have a real life experience working with patients who, you know, very likely on anti-depression medication, anti-anxiety medication. Uh, we very much believe there are probably going to be numerous different types of license types based on what client and patient needs are, right? You probably don't want a facilitator working with someone who is on anti-depression medication that is not certified and trained to work with people who are on anti-depression medication. And so um, there's going to be numerous different types of, of licenses within the facilitator realm that we imagine. Um, and a lot of that is going to be incredibly important to make sure that people can safely access and benefit from psilocybin therapy. So that is um, essentially the, the reason for the preparation session. Also, just to make sure people understand what they're getting into. There's going to be a lot of people that will be seeking psilocybin services that, you know, have experienced psilocybin before. And there's going to be a lot of people who have never heard of or experienced psilocybin. And so ensuring that they understand the importance of what is going to, you know, what could occur in that experience it's incredibly important. It's also important that the client or the patient have an opportunity to build a relationship with the licensed facilitator. Those of you who uh, work in this field are more than familiar with the importance of building trust between a client, a patient, and a facilitator. And we believe that trust is very much needed in this program as well. So the second step is the psilocybin therapy session itself, which will occur at a licensed service center. Uh, and the facilitator must be present through the entire process. And uh, last but certainly not least is the integration session. Again, something that I'm sure a lot of folks here are more than familiar with. The research continues to show the prolonged benefits uh, for folks who are able to integrate after psilocybin therapy session, just like with talk psychotherapy, going once probably doesn't necessarily unpack at the deepest level, the current issues that you may be experiencing. And so the same is to be said for psilocybin experiences as well. Uh, and so integration sessions are gonna be incredibly important uh, in terms of offering and services and things of that nature. So uh, moving on to the campaign here, um, we do not have any well-organized, well-funded opposition. Um, and you know, uh, that's, great. That's not to say that couldn't change. That's not to say that there aren't people who oppose or have their concerns with this measure. There certainly are. Um, but overall, the challenge for this campaign is education. People, the vast majority of people simply don't know what psilocybin is. Uh, and so it's going to be our job to educate Oregon voters on essentially the following five questions. What does psilocybin do? 
what does the research say? What does this measure do and what safeguards and controls are contained within the measure? What does the measure not do? And who stands to benefit from having access to psilocybin therapy? Veterans, people with end of life anxiety that have been given terminal illnesses and communities, primarily BIPOC communities that are disproportionately affected by COVID and the pandemic right now. And so it is not lost on us um, that talking about creating equitable access to psilocybin therapy within a larger, arguably already in inaccessible uh, healthcare program is a lot easier said than done. And so we are working uh, with numerous BIPOC individuals and organizations here in Oregon and nationally to really center BIPOC communities in the conversation around what equitable access really needs to look like from a patient perspective and from a licensee perspective. Again, this is where we can take a lot of lessons from the cannabis industry. Um, I've actually been involved with helping draft equity legislation with the Minority Cannabis Business Association for some time, and I sit on their policy committee, um, where they have developed templates for equitable licensing to ensure that people within the BIPOC community have access to not only the licensees, but also to ensure that they have access to the services themselves. And so I think we have our work cut out for us on ensuring um, that we can create equitable access both on the licensing side of things and on the services side of things. And I'm gonna actually have to stop my screen share for a second and redo this because I always forget to select the sound button. Bear with me one moment. This is a very short educational um, video that we just put together um, that uh, our friends at MindMed Australia actually allowed us to repurpose. Um, and so I'm just gonna play this for you. It's just two minutes, it should be really quick, but it goes over a lot of what I just talked about, but sums it up way better than I typically can most of the time. So here we go. Almost all of us in Oregon have a friend or neighbor who struggles with mental health challenges. These are everyday problems, even before the pandemic and recession, depression, anxiety, addiction. Too many Oregonians have spent years moving from medication to medication and doctor to doctor with little relief for feelings of severe depression or anxiety. We need other options. Those other options may soon be available. There's new research being conducted on therapy using psilocybin, a plant medicine. It's being studied for mental health benefits now at New York University, Johns Hopkins University, UCLA. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration found that it's a, quote, breakthrough therapy, giving a green light to path-breaking research. Psilocybin therapy would be regulated, permitted only in licensed offices, and not legalized for recreational use. There would be a controlled framework with strict safeguards in place. It takes place with a licensed and trained facilitator after a thorough evaluation and screening process. In a preparation session in the days before, you discuss the details of the day and what to expect from the session itself. On the day of the treatment, the client takes the psilocybin and experiences the effects, always with guidance and supervision. After the session ends, in an integration session in the days after, the client returns to discuss the experience, interpret what happened, and how to put it to good use in the future. Pioneering research studies show psilocybin therapy may help people break troublesome mental patterns and find new ways to cope with past traumas and difficulties. And it helps them do so without resorting to high daily doses of pharmaceuticals with all kinds of side effects. People are living happier lives. It's a new approach worth considering. Uh, continuing to move on, almost done with the slideshow here, and then we can get to Q&A and discussion. Uh, a little bit about what we know it's going to take in order to win. Um, statewide education through paid media. Frankly, at the end of the day, we have an amazing grassroots, uh, am an amazing amount of grassroots support here in Oregon. We collected over 164,000 signatures, um, 34,000 of which came in the time of COVID by mail from people in th over 300 cities across the state of Oregon. Uh, I did not even know there were 300 cities in the state of Oregon. Um, so uh, that I think really speaks to the geographic diversity of people that are interested in this. I really think that um, this is an issue as most drug policy issues continue to do, is one that transcends partisan politics. 
and should. Um, suffering is not partisan. Depression, anxiety, addiction, not partisan. I don't think psilocybin therapy should be considered partisan either. So number two uh, is building political endorsements to legitimize and normalize uh, psilocybin therapy with elites. Uh, at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, there is a political power structure at play within uh, the Oregon ballot measure process. And we stand to win or lose based on whether or not we can educate and in certain circumstances persuade um, some of those political elites. So whether those be um, different political parties um, and um, you know, different organizations, community leaders, f leaders of faith, et cetera, we're reaching out to absolutely everyone. We cannot leave one vote behind if we expect to win in November. And number three um, is utilizing the researchers, the scientists and the experts to persuade movable voters. So our polling really shows, which I think I have a slide on later, um, that when we're able to combine the science and the research and the promise that that shows with the emotional appeal and the stories of people who have benefited from psilocybin therapy or that stand to benefit from psilocybin therapy, we know a majority of Oregonians will support this measure. And so at the end of the day, it's up to us whether or not we're going to be able to educate enough Oregon voters in order to win come November. So here's a little bit of a mathematical breakdown for you. Um, essentially, we expect about 2.2 million voters um, to cast their ballots this November. Um, so based on that, we need 50% plus one. So a little over 1.1 million people in Oregon need to vote yes. Um, you know, luckily, uh, based on our polling and our focus groups, we start with just under 900,000 people um, supporting this measure, right? Um, but that leaves us with a pretty decent deficit of around uh, just under 220,000 people that are currently no votes or maybe your undecided votes. And so we need to get, you know, just under a, about a quarter of a million Oregonians to change their mind or, be, or to become more comfortable in order to win this November. So um, here's a little bit of a breakdown. Um, and as I said, you know, certainly uh, you see pretty, uh, you know, stark differences here between political parties and their support. But I think the point that I really want to highlight here, let me use my pointer, is that we win in every category. We can sway people in every category with education by helping people understand what psilocybin is, what the research shows, what our measure is, what it's not, and who stands to benefit. We all know someone that's suffering. It doesn't matter which party you do or don't affiliate with. We have votes to gain on every single one of these categories. And so, again, there's no vote that we can afford to leave behind between now and November. And that's why we're reaching out to absolutely everyone we can to educate. So um, last little section here, a couple of our endorsements to date. Um, this is uh, Senator Elizabeth Steiner Hayward, who also happens to be a medical doctor, a family physician at OHSU. Uh, she is also the co-chair of Ways and Means in the legislature, um, which means she's an incredibly um, influential legislator. And she herself has not been shy about sharing the mental health struggles that she's had. Uh, and so we're very lucky to have her on board, not only as a family physician and a senator's doctor, but she's also a mother. And so um, that's really, you know, she is a, a great example of the type of spokespeople that we are putting out into the public to show, you know, this is something that, um, you know, a lot of folks are supporting and especially folks from a lot of the, the healthcare uh, sector. And so we're, we're super lucky to have Elizabeth Sunner Hayward on board. This is Dr. Janice Knox, uh, who is also a, a medical doctor of 40 years, also an MBA. Um, for those of you that are familiar in the cannabis uh, side of things, you may actually know uh, one or two of Dr. Janice's daughters, both also medical doctors with MBAs. Um, Dr. Rachel Knox sits on the Cannabis Commission, um, and the entire family has been incredibly supportive uh, of this measure. And again, we're super lucky to have Dr. Janice Knox involved here. Um, both Dr. Janice Knox and Dr. Rachel Knox sit on our Health Equity Committee uh, and are helping drive the conversations around what health equity and licensing really needs to look like in order for us to really make this an equitable program once it's implemented. You may recognize this guy, Congressman Earl Blumenauer, um, probably one of the most progressive drug policy champions in the country, arguably. 
Um, Earl Blumenauer actually endorsed our campaign about a year ago and didn't even tell us he endorsed it. He just said it to the media and that's how we found out, uh, which is kind of funny, but I'm um, really lucky to have Earl on board. He's been going to bat for us for a very long time. This is Dr. Nick Giddens, who is also a family physician, um, but uh, is also, I think more importantly, a hospice medical director. Um, a lot of these studies that have been coming out, specifically studies out of NYU, have shown extreme promise for people who have been given a terminal diagnosis or that are suffering from end-of-life anxiety. Uh, Dr. Gideon Osman often talks about how we do have tools to help treat um, people's pain at the end of their life, but we do not have quite uh, nearly as many tools for treating mental anguish that people suffer from uh, being given a, a terminal diagnosis or um, essentially being told that they only have a certain amount of time to live. And so um, that's one of the many reasons that Dr. Gideon's is involved with their campaign is very supportive, is really speaking from the end of life and palliative care perspective and being able to help people um, who are suffering with, with end of life anxiety and, and mental anguish. This is Cameron Witten, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Black Resilience Fund. Uh, for those of you who live here in Portland, you may be familiar with them. Uh, the Black Resilience Fund is a nonprofit organization that um, raises money to financially support Black Portlanders, whether it be paying bills, um, being able to um, provide hot meals, um, you know, basic family needs, buying back to school supplies or whatever it might be for kids. Um, you know, they've, I think they've raised just about $2 million over the last three months. Uh, incredible work. Um, Cameron himself, uh, unfortunately, is no stranger um, to addiction. Um, I actually got to meet Cameron's brother a couple of weeks ago, um, who is currently struggling uh, with addiction. And so, um, you know, he's, he's grown up in a family that's um, unfortunately gone through a, a lot of abuse as well. And so that's one of the reasons that Cameron's uh, supportive of creating new options for folks who are struggling with depression, anxiety, and addiction. And this is Chad Kusky, uh, which uh, is one of our veteran spokespeople. And I'm gonna go ahead and play this very short um, interview with Chad that uh, may end up being uh, on a television ad sometime in the next couple of months. Oh. I was a Navy SEAL, 18 years, 12 combat deployments. I took a medical retirement. I suffered depression, anxiety, trauma, injuries on the inside. I couldn't live life outside. Dark thoughts. I tried talk therapy. Doctors threw pills at me. Nothing worked. Psilocybin therapy? I don't have the words. It breaks patterns of negative thoughts. You gain this awareness about yourself and it sticks. Yes on 109 means a new life without suffering. And uh, for those of you who might still read the physical paper, I didn't know it still existed, to be honest, but it does. Uh, and uh, Chad was actually featured on the front page of the Oregonian yesterday. Um, Chad, is, as you mentioned in the interview there, was in the Navy SEALs for 18 years, 12 combat deployments. Um, and he came back, unfortunately, very damaged. Um, depression, anxiety, suicidality, anger, um, addiction to alcohol, uh, drugs, um, he had it all. And, um, you know, he's, he's one of the, 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 real, the real stories that I think resonates with a lot of people, um, especially people who maybe haven't heard of psilocybin or um, maybe generally anti-drug. They don't, they don't get it when they just hear the general, the facts. But when they hear stories like Chad and they're able to connect the dots like, I know someone like Chad, or there are probably other veterans just like Chad that deserve access to something new that isn't opioids, that isn't just prescriptions. Um, you know, they, they tend to step outside their original box and, and take a second look about why they might support something like this. So uh, I'll just wrap up with a couple of our other latest endorsements um, that we've gotten over the last month. Oregon ACLU, Cascades AIDS Project, the entire Democratic Party of Oregon, uh, Next Up, which is an organization that works to mobilize and educate youth on getting involved in politics, CALSA Oregon, Law Enforcement Action Partnership, which is comprised of hundreds of former law enforcement officials from across the country, Veterans of War, and the Heroic Hearts Project, which uh, provides financial assistance for veterans to be able to seek um, different psychedelic uh, therapies. 
And the list goes on, different county Democrat organizations, other veterans organizations, Chakruna is a notable uh, addition to this list as well, Tocativity, many others. Um, we have over 130 healthcare, licensed healthcare providers that have endorsed the measure. Uh, many doctors and PhDs listed here, um, therapists, counselors, nurses, social workers, veterans, more retired law enforcement, a couple of notable individuals, David Bronner, Paul Stamets, and I have talked for long enough. So I would like to go ahead and stop there. And perhaps, um, Evan, unless you had anything that you wanted to say, I could just go ahead and start with some of the questions in the, in the chat box here. Yeah, that sounds great to me. Just very quickly before I uh, forget this, speaking of her a Heroic Hearts Project, anyone interested um, in that specific organization and how this will affect uh, the lives of veterans in Oregon, um, we are having a similar meeting to this with the founder of yep. Heroic Hearts Project, Jesse Gould, uh, and that'll be on Sunday, this Sunday. So check that out if you're interested. And uh, yeah, uh, the floor is once again yours, Sam. Thank you for the presentation. Alrighty, um, so let me just go to the chat here. Oh, hey Tim, I, uh, I see that Max uh, K has his hand up. I can unmute him or you can unmute him if you want. He might have a pressing question to go first, I don't know. Okay, well I was just gonna go with the people that had put uh, questions in the comments and then unless there's a different order that you'd prefer. No, that, that's great. That, that's how we should go. And, and Max, if you could uh, just put your question in the comments, that would be uh, probably the smoothest way to go about this. Thanks buddy. All right, um, so a quick question from Noah. Will there be any effort to collect data on how patients uh, respond to help make the case to health insurance companies that is a cost-saving way to provide mental health treatment? Excellent question. Uh, I sure hope so. I think that if I had to guess what the, um, the main question that will be there that will probably ab well, will absolutely come up during the two-year rulemaking period is um, HIPAA laws and privacy around patient data. Um, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm no attorney and no expert in patient data law, but I know that it is um, a very complicated layered subject and I'm sure other people are more qualified to speak to than I am on this call. Um, but I do know that, um, you know, in terms of opportunities that are on the table here for Oregon, there's an opportunity to lead in expanding the amount of research that is going on in, around the country right now. And so I think that in terms of being able to continue to expand opportunities for people who are suffering from not just depression, anxiety, addiction, but many other uh, things that are being studied right now, um, I, I, I would imagine that the Oregon Health Authority is probably going to take a deep dive on what data can be collected safely that will still be incredibly valuable for continuing to further the research within the realm of psilocybin therapy. So uh, next question is from Zach. Um, which is uh, not actually a question, I don't think, but more of a comment around insurance companies, which is, again, a very um, a just uh, point in that um, we need insurance, cover insurance coverage uh, for this um, to be able to provide as much access as possible. I could not agree more. Uh, and again, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that insurance companies are gonna cover this. Um, obviously, as I mentioned before, we are certainly advocating and doing our best to educate providers and insurance companies. Um, well, I can't say that we've had a ton of meetings with insurance companies, but we've certainly met with providers generally um, throughout the state that are interested in educating. Um, and I, I think that insurance companies are probably not going to get very serious about getting involved in this until it passes, um, which is unfortunate, but un it's just a political reality, I think. So um, I do think that we have our work cut out for us in making the case to insurance companies, and we hope that um, we'll have a lot of support in making that case as well. Hey, Sam. Yes. Would you mind speaking a little bit to why insurance companies would be for and also maybe why they would be against supporting something like Measure 109? Um, I could, but I don't really feel comfortable speaking on behalf of insurance companies. I could tell you that <laughs> uh, the reason that they would oppose it is that it threatens their bottom line of medications now. The reason that they'd be for it is private companies could come in and make a play to take away their patient base. But again, I'm not a healthcare insurance expert by any means. Um, so I don't mean to cop out of that question, um, but I just think, you know, we're going to learn a lot more about where they stand once this passes. I think, you know, just like 
there is a certain group of people that didn't take us very seriously prior to qualifying. Um, there's going to be a certain group of people um, that won't take us very seriously until we win. And I think insurance companies probably fall into that category. Thank you. Um, I see, it looks like a statement from Anne there, or let's see here. It looks like there's a question here. Let me, um, Uh, I'm very excited about this legislation. However, I have grave concerns about the prohibition against the OHA setting an educational requirement beyond a high school diploma, the licensed facilitator. Um, as someone who regularly works with individuals in trauma histories, I think it's a huge mistake to allow people to provide services without any formal health training. Uh, have the authors of this bill um, thought about what would happen? Okay, yeah. So let me clarify this because that's not actually the case, um, but is a very common misconception for those of you who have taken the time to read this uh, measure line by line. Um, there is a baseline uh, of requirements. Um, that is certainly not the end of the road in terms of what will be required for someone to be, to have any license type. Again, let's be clear. The Oregon Health Authority has the final say on what these rules and regulations and training requirements are going to be. And they're not gonna let just anyone who can pass a 20 question multiple test to be a licensee here. Um, so while there is a prohibition on requiring certain, like, like requiring that you have to be a licensed therapist, there's a reason for that. And I think that the reason this community, you know, will likely appreciate, which is that on the one hand, just because you're an ER doctor that's been in traditional medicine for 30 years does not mean you know anything about psilocybin. And on the flip side, just because you've been doing good, you know, perhaps underground work with individuals for 30 years does not necessarily mean that you have the ethical and medical training requirements and certifications that you might need to have to be able to provide psilocybin therapy. And so this really creates a path in the middle that allows and affords the ability for people from both ends of that spectrum to participate in this program. So we did not feel like we had, we should require, you have to be a licensed therapist, right? And that's really a nod to what's going on now. There's plenty of people that are doing amazing work that are not formally licensed, right? But in order for this program to be, you know, to pass in November, there had to be some type of training and certification requirements. And that is going to be one of the big items that's going to be discussed in the two-year rulemaking period in terms of what requirements from a training and certification will be required um, for is certainly for some of the people that are going to be seeking psilocybin services that do have existing um, mental illness conditions. I can imagine the Oregon Health Authority, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to work with people who are on anti-depression, anti anxiety medication, the Oregon Health Authority will probably require you to have some type of training and background in that field. Uh, and so I think that is really where um, a lot of the training and certification requirements are going to be spelt out in that two-year period. And um, moving on to Brian here. So it's the governor who has complete power to appoint the board within the Oregon Health Authority that will ultimately decide on all the details of how this pans out. Um, yes and no. The governor appoints the psilocybin advisory board. The Oregon Health Authority has final say on all rules, regulations, and licensing. Um, so, you know, if you look at other things that the governor appoints, but then an agency has final say on, like, sure, maybe the governor will hand select each of these people, but at the end of the day, she or whoever it might be um, at that time, um, you know, is gonna be looking to other people in her office at the Oregon Health Authority to help make determinations of who's gonna be qualified to sit on that advisory board. Um, and uh, any sense of the level of support or perspective on 109, I assume you're referring to the governor of the Oregon Health Authority. Generally, no. Um, I don't think this is an issue that Governor Brown feels she needs to get involved with one way or another. You know, she has generally been fairly, you know, progressive or at least not anti-progressive drug policy. Um, I don't see that she's going to have any 
you know, problems with this, you know, but again, I, I can't, nor will I speak for her on this. Um, I haven't had any personal conversations with her. So um, I think the, the jury might be out on that one in general. And Max, got your question in there. <laughs> um, let's see here. So if this passes, as the language in the measure stands, does it require patients to have an established relationship with their therapist, meaning working with them more than just once or two times if you're using this therapy, or would it be hashed out during the rulemaking period? Great question. Um, the requirement in the measure as it is, is that you have to attend at least one preparation session. Now, that could, that could be rolled out in rulemaking to require to say that a facilitator has the right to reserve that they say, actually, I don't think you're ready yet. I think you may need two preparation sessions or three, or I'm not the right facilitator in that you just revealed to me that you're on a certain medication that I'm not credentialed to work with. And so I need to refer you to someone else who will be a good fit. So I think, again, a good way to think about this measure is there's really a foundational skeleton that does have some pieces that are figured out, but we did not feel, you know, um, comfortable really diving into every single little detail because one, we want this to be something that is a discussion and that all stakeholders have an opportunity to participate in. And so that's really one of the reasons, again, why the two year rulemaking period uh, exists. Um, does this measure aim to define what integration means or what the model may look like? Um, I believe there's probably a general description of integration, but again, as, as we just mentioned, I expect that to be built out a lot more than it is now. Um, and there'll probably be additional requirements that the Oregon Health Authority and the Psilocybin Advisory Board considers um, when fleshing that out. So time will tell is the, the short answer on that one. Uh, our very own Evan. Who is developing the training protocols for the facilitators? That will be the psilocybin advisory board. And again, uh, as I mentioned before, but it's worth mentioning again, um, I can very easily imagine that the advisory board and the Oregon Health Authority and the governor would all agree that they'd be well served to create subcommittees for certain uh, areas of discussion. So, you know, um, I know that a lot of our members on our health equity committee are going to be advocating that the Oregon Health Authority create a special equity committee specifically to talk about just creating equitable access and licensing. I can envision there being um, a producer uh, equity or a producer committee just to talk about, you know, the ways in which psilocybin it can and should be produced in an ethical and um, safe and, 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 and proper manner. Um, and numerous other um, different subject areas that may merit their own subcommittees as well. Um, on one slide, it says licensed manufacturer of psilocybin. How many licenses are being proposed? Uh, will we be allowed to grow at home or will we need a license? Um, there are, there is no cap on how many cultivation or manufacturer licenses um, that there are. Uh, no, you will not be able to grow at home. Um, and um, that is, um, uh, that's part of the provisions of the measure. So this will need to be at a, at a licensed facility. Um, vertical integration will be allowed. Uh, I can envision that many service centers will probably have, um, you know, uh, operations there as well, uh, as I'm sure everyone here probably knows way more than I do. Um, you know, to, you know, cultivating psilocybin is not really comparable to cultivating cannabis. It requires not nearly as much overhead. The turnaround time for cultivation is much less. Um, you need less space, et cetera. Um, so I, I can envision that um, there are probably fewer licensees than we saw in the cannabis industry as well. Um, but again, I know a lot of people, um, you know, have a great interest in that, not only just from a, a general cultivation perspective, but probably from, um, you know, an, a research and development perspective as well. Um, you know, I've certainly seen in my time on the campaign and prior many innovative uh, different ways that people are starting to work with psilocybin for different needs that people have. And uh, we very much expect that to be part of this process as well. Um, one thing that I will also say about the licensing, um, which speaks to another lesson that we learned from cannabis um, in terms of the monopolization of licensing uh, that happened in cannabis, is that um, this measure 
uh, does cap the amount of licenses that any one individual or entity can have um, to one producer license and no more than five service center licenses. Um, so again, that doesn't necessarily prevent large interests from coming in and, and, and participating in this program, but we hope that it provides as a defense mechanism from a complete licensing takeover um, from interests that may not um, be as pure as other folks wanting to really help people. Um, so um, that is a, a, a protection measure, if you will, that is included in the measure. Um, another um, uh, leg up measure, shall we call it, um, that's included in the measure is a residency requirement. Uh, anyone who wants to seek a license uh, for the first couple of years in which this program is up and running will need to be a resident of Oregon. And so um, you'll have to be a resident of Oregon for at least two years in order to seek a license. Um, and so that is another thing that, again, really is a nod to Oregonians, right? And it's something that Oregon voters, even if they haven't heard of psilocybin, we really believe uh, want to hear too, is that we're not just opening the floodgates for people, you know, no offense if anyone is a therapist in California on this call, but, you know, thousands of therapists from California or people that are interested in coming to Oregon and then getting all the licenses and leaving Oregonians in the dust. Um, but that the, the residency rule will sunset um, I believe in 2025 as well. Um, and so that's just another way that we're really trying to make this Oregon centric. Um, the natural follow-up question to this was what about people who are actually just seeking psilocybin therapy? Do they have to be residents? The answer is no. Uh, anyone will be able to access psilocybin therapy services whether or not they're Oregon residents. So um, we envision there to be um, a decent initial demand, shall you say, for psilocybin services. Um, from here in Oregon, obviously being the state with the most severe mental health crisis in the country, um, but you know, there's people suffering everywhere. So we very much expect folks to travel to Oregon to seek these services. Um, there's well-documented history of psilocybin use among indigenous communities for spiritual uh, and healing ends. What efforts has 109 taken to account these needs, perspectives, and input of each community? It's a great question. It's one of the exact reasons why we have our health equity committee. Um, one of our members is actually, um, his name is, uh, well, I won't reveal his name, but um, he has um, been working and is um, a member of a tribal nation here in Oregon um, and has been working in, um, working with those ceremonial practices here in Oregon for decades. Uh, and so we are very much continuing to center and elevate those voices in advising the campaign how we need to be continuously conscious of not only the cultural history, but the ceremonial practices that, you know, we stand to learn from um, and that, you know, can be informative for the continuation of development in terms of the rules and regulatory process that will occur during the two-year rulemaking period. Um, uh, from Ginger, I thought I saw some of the big names are already expected to be on the board, including Francois Borzat, uh, Robin Carhart Harris, and Paul Stamets. Uh, yes, that's a great opportunity for uh, me to be uh, making a clarification. So our campaign has an advisory board. Uh, that is not the same thing as what the advisory board will be uh, under the Oregon Health Authority. So we have we are incredibly lucky to have people, Francois Sporzat, for those of you who do not know, the author of Consciousness Medicine, um, is a fantastic book and primer, especially for folks who are considering, um, you know, becoming potentially a, a licensed facilitator. Um, Paul Stamets is another, obviously, a, a you know, very well-known mycologist here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, as well as Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, who is uh, the lead researcher at the Imperial College of London, um, are all people who are in support of this measure uh, and act as advisors to the campaign and are helping us kind of branch out uh, really at the national level to kind of bring in, you know, other folks that are influential in each of their own respects. So those are just some of the friends and advisors of the campaign. That is not the same thing as the advisory board that will be appointed by the governor and that will work with the Oregon Health Authority. Uh, John Schultz, I see we answered that question already. Uh, Max, good question. Why two years of rulemaking? Seems a bit long. Uh, I personally agree, um, but there's a lot of people that would argue that it's not long enough. Um, one of the biggest counter arguments we get is you should just wait for the FDA. And we understand that. Um, 
but we're confident that the research is promising enough to get this program started now, right? Um, one of the things that our measure does mandate is that we make our best efforts to work with the federal government and the people that are working with clinical trials to learn from what they're learning. Uh, and frankly, we believe that they may stand to benefit from learning from some of the models that we're taking. Like, if you can show you can safely benefit, you should have access. You shouldn't necessarily have to have a qualifying condition in order to access psilocybin therapy. So, you know, I think a lot of um, individual opponents of this measure say, this doesn't go far enough. This is conservative. That's fair. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But in terms of what model is going on, the clinical model and general public perception, this is, this is pretty far out there uh, in terms of setting a, a standard for, for other states to follow. And so uh, it, it, is an, it, it is, you know, arguably an incremental step in the larger scope of what we know is coming in terms of all of the psychedelic plant medicines that are being uh, researched and showing real promise for all different types of demographics. But at the end of the day, um, unfortunately, in order to create new opportunities within law, we do have to take individual steps in certain ways. So there are sacrifices to be made, um, but um, small price to pay for being able to create new opportunities for people who are suffering where other things have, have fallen short. Hey, Sam, can I jump in here for Please. a second? So, uh, yeah, I just want to uh, clarify with everyone, we uh, have, distinguished with Sam that we uh, will be asking him questions till seven. I just want to set the boundaries that Sam, uh, you know, you are only obliged to stay here until then. Questions, you were three more. Uh, I think that uh, I'll be here till eight to just continue facilitating a discussion. I know a lot about this campaign and I think I could have uh, done a somewhat decent job at answering a lot of these questions too. So. Um, no one be discouraged. I'll try to do my best once uh, Sam um, decides to to step off. But you know, take take your time, Sam, as as much as you'd like. Uh, please feel free. But I just want to set that boundary in case you, uh, yeah, would like. It. Cool. Back to you, Sam. Appreciate that, Evan. Um, so a, a question from Kate Gallagher. Um, let's see here. What uh, what happens to underground practitioners? How do they not get hijacked by the <laughs> by the medical model that we're proposing here? Uh, sure, fair question, uh, and one that often gets really confused. So I'm glad that you asked this. It provides uh, me an opportunity to set the record straight. Our measure does not change any current criminal code or laws does not criminalize psilocybin. Psilocybin is already criminalized. Um, and for those of you who may be familiar with measure 110, if that also passes, will be decriminalized. Um, and does not do anything uh, for current un you know, underground practitioners. Think of it this way. Um, criminal law exists here. Our measure exists here and creates a new program in which psilocybin therapy will be available within a licensed and regulated structure. So they're not, they do not touch each other. Um, there's been a lot of misinformation about our campaign criminalizing psilocybin. That is false. Psilocybin is criminalized already. We are creating a new legal option for people to access psilocybin therapy through a therapeutic context. Uh, and that is, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not full scale legalization. It's not legalization of retail sales, obviously, but it's an incremental step in terms of creating a program in which people can safely access psilocybin therapy. Um, so again, just to be very, very clear, our measure does not criminalize psilocybin. It's already criminalized. Uh, it creates a new model in which people can access psilocybin therapy in a therapeutic context. Um, let's see here. Uh, Jason, you showed a slide of a person discussing end of life distress and psilocybin. Will this be explicitly allowed? Yes, there are no qualifying conditions that you have to have in order to access psilocybin therapy. You will simply have to go through the preparation session uh, and ensure that you can safely benefit um, and access psilocybin therapy and that you're not contraindicated. Um, and again, we do not define what contraindicated will or will not be. That will also be a very important aspect 
um, of the two-year rulemaking period. Uh, Max calls out the one opposition statement that we do have in the voters pamphlet statement from the Oregon Psychiatric Physicians uh, Association. Um, you know, frankly, we were surprised that was the only one. We expected at least three or four. Uh, for those who are not familiar, the voters pamphlet statements are the um, in favor and opposition statements that will be included in every voters guide that goes out with every ballot that will be mailed in November. Um, we personally received 35 in favor statements that I think, frankly, will drown out the Oregon Psychiatric Physicians Association. Um, we have, you know, I think over 40 doctors um, that signed on to statements. We have community leaders. We have therapists. Um, you know, we have progressive civil liberty organizations. Um, you know, we have veterans organizations. We had 63 mothers sign on to a statement. Um, I think that. Um, you know, while the Oregon Psychiatric Physicians Association opposition statement was unfortunate, um, you know, it wasn't surprising. I attempted to schedule campaign briefings with them numerous times to which they would not even allow us to present. Um, so they were pretty set against this measure out of the, out of the gate. Um, you know, I don't entirely expect them to like buy TV commercials or really go any much further out of their way than submit that voters pamphlet statement, but we'll be ready if they do. Um, so that's certainly something um, that we'll be, we'll be prepared for if there is well-organized, well-funded opposition. But outside of that statement, and of course, some individuals that uh, may just generally have their own personal feelings about not being in favor of the measure, um, we do not have well-organized, well-funded opposition. Our, our main challenge is simply education. Um, would this measure protect manufacturers, facilitators, and patients from being prosecuted under federal law? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, that's just simply how federal law works. Um, you know, technically, if the feds wanted to try and bust people for the thousands of cannabis businesses that we have here in Oregon, they could do that too. Um, you know, and that's a question that we certainly get from a lot of the researchers that are wary of a state moving forward with a program. Um, you know, I, my crystal ball doesn't say one way or another whether or not, you know, the federal government will try and intervene if this law passes. But that's another reason why we have a two year rulemaking period and we are going to be working to ensure that we are trying to work with them again to the extent that they're willing to work with us. Time will tell. I think the big thing that we have on our side that cannabis does not is the fact that the Food and Drug Administration, a federal government entity, has given psilocybin a breakthrough therapy designation. Uh, that would be pretty ironic and almost definition in, uh, definitionally hypocritical uh, for the federal government to come in. It certainly would not be the first time the government has been hypocritical. So uh, with that, um, time will tell. But um, I think at the end of the day, between the science, the carefully thought out regulations and requirements and two-year rulemaking period, that it's fairly unlikely that we would see any type of immediate uh, intervention from the federal government. Uh, again, similar answer in terms of, are there any protections from the federal government in terms of uh, patients or licensees from the federal government? There is no per state protection from federal government intervention at all, it doesn't exist. Um, but again, you know, for the feds to come after especially an up and running program, they're not just coming after you, me, or the licensed facilitators or the patients, they're coming after the governor. We're all in this together. We are in the same boat. So if they come after one of us, they have to come after all of us. And I find it hard to believe that the federal government would have the resources to efficiently and effectively do that. Again, that's not to say that they won't. I can't promise you one way or another. And that's just my personal opinion that, you know, the way that we're going about this um, is very intentional and done for a reason. One of those reasons is to make sure that we're not poking the federal bear, if you will, uh, in any wrong ways. Um, but again, at the end of the day, time will tell. Um, alrighty, uh, let's see here. Is there a position on the measure from the Oregon Health Authority? Um, I have an impression they already have more work than they can do. That's probably true. Um, and um, you know, one of the one of the things that is included in this is um, a 15% tax on psilocybin product. 
Um, that is not to be any type of windfall for the state. This whole program is not meant to be a boon for the state. It's simply meant to cover the cost of the program. And um, the fiscal estimate that the Secretary of State's office gave this measure shows that once the program is up and running, it should be revenue neutral, which means no cost to the taxpayer. So um, we were excited to hear about that. Uh, and we hope that it stays that way. I think best case scenario is maybe it tosses a couple dollars in the state coffers. Uh, I hope the Oregon Health Authority would consider instead of tossing that money in the state coffers to give it uh, to some type of program or nonprofit entity that is working uh, to create more equitable access to this program. But again, um, time will tell. And the other answer is that um, government entities cannot take positions on measures. I actually found that out uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, in approaching some other city and county government organizations. But um, they may have feelings internally behind closed doors. I'm sure they do. But they cannot officially take a pro or against stance on measures. Uh, do you think there will be a problem finding manufacturers with the possible federal criminal sanctions? Um, probably not. Uh, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's not going to take a ton of manufacturers to be able to supply the demand uh, in Oregon. And uh, that's my personal opinion. I don't know. Um, but just based on, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I do not think that, um, there'll be any shortage of supply. Um, I can pretty much I hope there's not. 100% confirm there will be no shortage of supply. Like Sam said, that it's not hard to, I mean, one, one human being could grow in one room what it would take to supply the entire state for an entire year uh, after this program passes. And uh, I, I've spoken to many people that plan to open service centers and a large majority of them plan to grow the medicine themselves within the facility, which is, is allowed. Um, okay, yeah, so this will be a, the final question, then I'll hand it over to Evan. So the measure is about mushrooms or synthetic psilocybin. Excellent question. Um, our measure allows both. Uh, and in fact, uh, there is a, a protection, which is a little bit of a, a nod to the cultural history of the naturally occurring mushroom, which is that the Oregon Health Authority may not ban the use of the natural product. So we don't require just synthetic, we don't require just the natural product, both are allowed. And I think there's arguments, you know, and as to why there are certain ways of doing R&D with synthetic methods that may be beneficial for certain populations. Again, that's way outside of my expertise. So feel free to, to you know, tell me otherwise. But um, there is a protection that the Oregon Health Authority may not ban the natural substance and natural occurring mushroom itself. So there is a protection in there for the mushroom. And with that, Evan, um, and everyone, I just want to thank you again. Um, this has been, um, you know, it, it's, it's just a pleasure um, to continue to work with folks who have, um, you know, been in the trenches on this work, doing a lot of this good work for a very long time. Um, I know that, um, you know, there's been between, you know, misinformation and simply people um, that are generally opposed. And, and even when they fully understand, they're still opposed. That's, that's okay. You know, um, at the end of the day, what I care about most, what the campaign cares about most is that people have the facts uh, and they have the information they need to make their own informed decision. Um, I do believe that a vast majority of Oregon voters will make a decision to vote yes. I hope that you'll join us. Um, and if you do have um, any additional questions or concerns that um, you want to express, um, you know, please feel free to, um, to contact Evan and, and get a hold of the campaign. and. Um, you know, definitely, definitely let us know. Um, we're, you know, incredibly um, crazy busy as we continue to move forward to November. But again, it's people like you is the reason that we're here in the first place. And so I just want to say thank you um, to everyone who has really um, helped us get this far. Um, and I, I really appreciate it. And um, thanks again for the opportunity, Evan, and everyone on the board and all of the members of PPS. It's, it's an honor to present here. Thanks so much, Sam. Uh, there was someone else uh, as, as well that had uh, a comment about the um, lack of strict qualifications for the practitioners. And I just kind of wanted to uh, open up a, a quick discussion about that and hear anyone's thoughts on, on what Anne had to say and also Sam's answer to uh, that question. 
should there be strict qualifications? Should people need master's degrees or PhDs or should they need to be clinical psychologists uh, or should, you know, um, should, should people feel safe and satisfied with the trainings and qualifications that are going to be required from the Measure 109 team? Go ahead, Ginger. Yeah, so, um, well, a couple of things. Um, to answer that, I am interested in being a therapist or coach, but I don't really want to go back to school for a master's degree if I don't have to. Um, and so I've been kind of just trying to gather information about what options might be available. And I have heard other people say what Sam said tonight, that um, not having people who are not licensed in that way, I mean, you'd be licensed, you'd be trained somehow, but having kind of tiers of people who are qualified to do that might be one way to make it more affordable for people. Um, obviously, if I do this, I mean, I would take it seriously and I would want to make sure that I could address whatever issue might, might come up. Um, so... I'm, I'm hoping that there's an option for people who don't have a master's degree and it is not to be disrespectful of people who have gone through that training. My mom was a marriage and family therapist, so I take that sort of thing really seriously. Um, I just am hoping that there's a way for me to do it without that. And then my other question that I was going to ask is totally unrelated. Do you want me to wait or throw it out there? No, please go for it. Yeah, my other question is just, do people have um, ideas about how to engage other people in the discussion about this so that you can educate them and hopefully convince them to vote for it? I've been talking to my neighbors and other people when it seems to be an appropriate thing to bring up in a conversation, but I don't want to just launch into it with the lady at the grocery checkout, you know? <laughs> so if anybody has any good ideas for ways to sort of sneak it in there, but not be pushy or obnoxious about, or scare people off, I would be, I'm all ears. Thank you. I think, uh, I think a really easy way right now is to make some type of comment about mushroom season. It, mushroom hunting is extremely popular in the Pacific Northwest and you'd be surprised like the type of people you find out in the forest mushroom hunting or like the type of people that have picked you know chanterelles in their backyard or whatever and so I think uh, a comment about mushrooms um, would be appropriate and then maybe leading that into uh, a conversation on psilocybin mushrooms if they seem super stoked about mushrooms in general that's that's been successful for me so, something ginger too that I, I think about too is just what's going on with current events and just the overload of information and the pandemic and the kind of looming mental health crisis that's already here in Oregon like Sam alluded to but I, I imagine will worsen as time goes on so that's usually a good segue to talk about the need for alternative therapies and, and it, you know let them know that this is happening this November and I would sort of hazard a guess that um, there might be, you know, like a half a sheet pamphlet or something available through the campaign. Um, and if there isn't, they might be willing to develop sort of a handout of like, you know, hey, here's, you know, here's the, the, the Cliff's Notes answer. Jason, would you like to say what you were going to say? Yeah, and it was just on the point of like the loose language that we're all reading about like, oh, this person doesn't need to be super qualified. And the number of people that we've been meeting at our coming to our meetings here and saying like, yeah, I want to become one of those people. Like probably, I mean, multiple per week I meet that say that to me. And I don't, I'm not like super social, you know, I mean, uh, I hear that just all the time. And so what I wanted to say about that is, is everybody has all these like minor, uh, I don't want to say minor, but like the individual fears, right? Like the person who is a mental health care uh, psychologist was like, what if somebody has a mental health care crisis and a mental health care person isn't there to fix it, right? There's going to be the shaman who's going to say the same thing. What about when this person's having a spiritual breakthrough and a mental health person is trying to diagnose them or is trying to so or like trying to put them through like oh this is just what's occurring with you so um why i wanted to what i wanted to bring that up to was that he pretty much just kept saying like uh 
all that's going to be sorted out in two years. Like pretty much we're just putting loose boundaries on that because uh, we don't want to be the ones to say it's going to be a doctorate or a master's or it has to be this or that. We're going to make other people set those uh, more firm boundaries. And so we don't know how much this actually looks like. We're just like conceptualizing like yes or no, but we have no idea what what it's going to actually look like played out uh, after that two year period or five years after that two year period or whatever. Um, that is true, but they, they do, I, I believe uh, I heard pretty clearly that uh, indigenous folks, there are like, I don't know if it's one or two seats or something that has to be uh, on the board that will be deciding all those things that would, will be held by, you know, uh, a native American or some other, indigenous person that's that's what i heard right they, that they would be one or two seats out of 16 but that it's coming down from the oregon health authority and the governor based essentially what the actual rules will be and we don't get to know those until that happens after a two-year waiting period and then we have to see not what they're saying is going to happen but then what actually happens in you know like i said two or five years yeah that is true and, and i think the fallback position is you know, whatever's going on right now, which is technically not legal, uh, will probably continue certainly for the two years and probably beyond because there will be people for whatever reason that don't choose to engage with this system. I know I, you know, I, I'm one of the casualties of, of the marijuana, uh, you know, transformations in the industry. And, you know, you just got to roll with it and, you know, evolve and change and, you know, do it engage with it if you want to and go your own way if it's not but but too that's you know that's a more uh outside drawing outside the lines of the coloring book approach <laughs> so um you reminded me that i'm pretty sure i've read on maps website about training that even they do envision an option for people who don't have master's degree or higher education but it's a lower priority um, I'd have to go back and revisit that, but I'm pretty sure that they do have something like that on there. Obviously not that they're making that decision, but they can see a space for that as well. Yeah, I think it's also important to just remember how, um, you know, how uncomfortable this might make so many professional people that have, um, you know, just like Anne Marie, uh, or, and M said in the chat, so many people that know what it takes, know exactly what it takes to work with uh, patients with severe mental diagnoses uh, and mental conditions and how quickly uh, a situation can turn sour if someone was unprepared to deal with said patient. And, uh, and it's also important to remember that we're really, we're really kind of setting the standard in Oregon, you know, for the entire country. And if we fuck this up some way, uh, it's going to have, you know, uh, detrimental ramifications for the progress of this type of legalization for who knows how long, you know, but, uh, it, you know, there's not an opposition in Oregon uh, for Measure 109 right now, except for um, the one that Max said in the chat, the psychiatrist union, but um, you know, I mean, just imagine Utah or Idaho or Montana or any other state trying to propose this type of uh, ballot measure and everyone could point to Oregon and how it didn't work because they were too loose with their facilitator trainings. And this person went to a sitter and it exploded and the person, yeah, whatever, you know, drove their car while they were under the influence and got in a crash or something like that. And so... Um, I think everyone's just trying to err on the side of extreme caution, which is why I'm pretty surprised that their qualifications are what they are. Uh, you know, like others have said, that, that want to be a part of this, but don't necessarily meet the, the standards. And I myself, you know, definitely don't have a master's degree, but I'm really looking forward to being involved in this, in this program. Um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's important that they err on the side of caution. That's all. I think uh, insurance companies are gonna be calling the tune to a certain extent. And what they want probably is uh, less expense. They want speedy therapy and, uh, you know, no lawsuits 
And so uh, that's the angle that they're going to be coming at this. Uh, so just to keep that in mind, uh, I think it's a great thing, though, I really. And I think it's also, uh, I know at Johns Hopkins, they're doing uh, LSD research. Uh, there's talk of LSD coming off of uh, Schedule 1. Uh, it's a nationwide effort uh, that a lot of people uh, in powerful positions are moving towards. So uh, I think it's kind of inevitable, whether it's smooth or whether it's rocky is, uh, is the question. Thank you. I'm interested in anyone, if anyone has any knowledge on how insurance companies uh, tackle people engaging in, in cannabis uh, as medicine or any type of cannabis therapy or, or how that works? Uh, well, one thing uh, insurance companies have been supporting is uh, acupuncture, uh, different treatment modalities like that. And uh, there is a lot of uh, research on the efficacy of acupuncture, but it's incredibly cheap and it's fast and people like it. So uh, and it seems to work. Uh, and so uh, I think that's why they like it. You know. Evan, can you speak to the cost on this? Because will it be just something we can like, okay, so say Evan becomes a facilitator, could you in theory like grow a box under your bed and then just treat people out of that box at a very low cost? Or what is the deal? No. So, well, obviously, at first I'd have to be trained and be part of the licensing process. And then once I was a licensed facilitator, I would need to work um, under a service center uh, you know, if that was my, if that was my living room, I would need to qualify and get my living room um, approved, you know, as a service center, uh, which, which is an easier process explained by their measure than, than you would think. Um, but what I'm is just kind of jumping around the service centers all over Oregon, which could be pretty cool. But I think that's also what Ginger was talking about and why it would be very beneficial to have, you know, people, for instance, like me, you know, that that has a lot of experience and, and lots of mental health uh, training and experience, but not actual, uh, you know, I don't have a master's degree. And so my rates compared to someone like, uh, you know, Dr. Matthew Hicks or Dr. Peter Addy or even Brian Pilecki would be extremely different, you know, which I mean is, is already a system that exists if you look at mental health, therapy, mental health therapy as it exists right now, you know, it's already extremely inaccessible because therapy is expensive. Therapists charge a lot of money. And if insurance doesn't cover this, and you need to pay a therapist a hundred bucks an hour, which is extremely average. You know, it goes up to 150 to 200 dollars for therapists, especially on the West Coast. Um, imagine paying someone that much for eight hours of a trip. Extremely, if you have people with maybe less um, less training, but the same uh, baseline qualifications, like the Measure 109, uh, you know, board training protocol group settings are going to bring the cost down tremendously um, and they're so equitable and accessible especially to um, like BIPOC communities that I think there is going to be a lot of with the um, acupuncture clinics okay I'm, I was just saying uh, what Ginger was saying about people that are less trained are going to be able to charge less. And so it's going to be accessible for people that have less training, because if you could imagine paying a therapist right now for eight hours of work, it would be crazy expensive. So someone that isn't completely qualified is going to be able to charge less. And uh, so, yes, that's my answer to your question, Jason. So what were we thinking? Like, what do you get to about like 2000 bucks, 1500, 2000 bucks, you think? For a session? No way. 
Um, I can say from my experience right now that that's kind of up there for um, underground therapy in Portland right now. The basis, base price that I've been seeing is about $1,000 for the preparation, the actual trip session, and the integration session. But I know several other people that charge, you know, 500, sometimes less for the whole, uh, for the whole process. And then if you factor in a group setting, that cost goes way, way, way down. Right. Um, but what about, that's the underground. What about, I'm talking about like, what is the cost of this above ground thing? Because won't they need to charge more to have the f legal facilities and, and all of that? the licensees and it's really interesting to think about how insurance uh you know malpractice insurance for people would uh explode i'm looking forward to the decriminalized one because one thing that caught my attention recently in the news was there was that big uh church arrest and all the headlines say mushroom church uh search and seized and all the all the headlines and social media said, you know, mushroom church, mushroom church, this many mushroom sees. But when you look into the fine tuning, there were no federal charges for the mushrooms themselves. So, you know, who knows if that that's coming or if they are, you know, just respecting that uh, local custom that that the local law enforcement there are not enforcing that. So maybe they are, you know, as um, as our speaker tonight said, you know, like they are behind it, you know, so they, they're not, they're not going to prosecute these people for having the mushrooms that they might be behind. So, uh, I was inspired by that. And that is because of the, the Oakland, the city of Oakland has decriminalized nature, which means they made the mushrooms so that, you know, everybody can possess them and grow them and, yeah. them and pick them. I highly doubt that the feds were like super cool and supportive of it. That's why they didn't charge them for the mushrooms. Uh, I read the article and they took so much cash from that church, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And um, uh, I think what probably pissed the feds off more is that they probably weren't paying taxes on a lot of that cash they were getting. Um, and like, but you know, they were, they're a church and I'm not sure how that works and, as, as that type of church. Maybe there is no, distinction but um i think i think what set that case off more than anything was the large amount of untaxed money uh that was you know not involved within the federal government's you know drug rings that they run um and you know i, I don't know if that was um i don't know if that's going to be an issue in, in oregon because everything will have the 15 percent tax that sam mentioned that's a really interesting case though. It's a really, really interesting case to compare it to everything that might happen in Oregon. A little bit because the other issue was what they are actually enforcing was being an illegal cannabis dispensary saying there's a legal channel for you to now do cannabis and you guys are outside of it. So now we have to enforce. And, um, you know, so creating a legal structure for something could serve towards you know right now yeah you go hey no we're not we're not planning for what the other side of the sun is going to be we're just moving towards the sun but once you get there and you know people start going oh trip sitters do this in their living room and it's just as effective and maybe more effective and it's four hundred dollars for the whole day versus uh you know uh whatever it is to go see a professional in their professional setting that's a licensed distributor or whatever it might be four or five multiples of the price of just doing it in a friend's living room or, you know, a friend could be free. So I might be ranting a little bit, but the, the enforcement side of it, what we're, what we saw was this, the feds not enforce that. And what they did enforce was they said there is a legal way. This is a, this is an illegal cannabis dispensary that has been making money. And, and if you want to have a cannabis dispensary, it needs to come this way. And what this church was doing, I guess, was having like, they would treat people there, right? They would have cannabis ceremonies and you could just, I think uh, Donna told us she's gone in there and just like bought weed. She said it's like the coolest and weird <laughs> place. So people we know have been there. 
But were they just selling shrooms, Evan? Do you know that? Could you just go in there and buy an eighth? Yeah, there's a similar church in. Yeah, be in the church and then you get shrooms for free. And it's like, cool. Um, but they do kind of make you go through a little walkthrough process. And, you know, it's not like they're just handing out much shrooms. That's extremely irresponsible. But they definitely take the time to explain it to each new up the space. Me and Jason continue rambling. Right. Please, let's hear from somebody else. <laughs> I got DMT discussion tomorrow night, so I'm going to be talking a lot, I'm sure. I hadn't heard about that church. Um, is that the same as somebody that they went after in Denver, people have been talking about? Unrelated. Hmm. Where was the church and how did they get $200,000? Can someone link the article to John? It was, uh, yeah, it's in Oakland and they were just calling them, they, they're considering themselves a church and they sell cannabis and they would have like mushroom ceremonies or something to that effect. I'm not completely sure, but check out the article and uh, it is a good topic of discussion. I'm sure it'll come up again. I met someone at the Portland event last summer who, who was doing that, a guy from Oakland. I can't remember his name. Might have been him. Mm -hmm. Might have been him. Yeah, I just wanted to say one last thing about, uh, about what you keep referring to, Jason, in terms of like, you know, how we might lose the ability to just sit for our friends. But uh, I'm actually really excited to see how the underground psychedelic uh movement uh you know continues to to grow and and connect especially alongside this above ground legal um legal system that's being built there will be so much more information about how to sit with someone and, and safe ways to set up a psychedelic experience um as this gets produced and and if you know the decriminalized bill passes alongside it, then people will feel a lot more safe being able to do whatever they want at home, growing and sitting with each other. And um, you know, I think it's going to be a lot more common once we see the legal system uh, like unfold, and people actually understand that what it takes to sit with someone with psychedelics it depends on the psychedelic but mushrooms i have a lot of experience with and it is not that hard you do not need a master's degree to do it it's not to say that it isn't an extremely emotionally uh taxing process but it, it takes the right type of person and it take it does take some training but it's really not that hard especially if you're going and following the, the protocol that they're doing in, in research studies in universities around the world, where the person has the headphones on and the eye shield, it's mostly sitting next to someone holding their hand for seven hours and then writing out whatever they mumble throughout the experience, uh, which, like I said, is not that hard. Um, and so once we see that play out so often, I don't really think people are going to pay a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars for the treatment especially if insurance doesn't cover it once they see that that's all that's happening everywhere um i think it's going to become extremely decentralized and a lot of people are going to take healing into their own hands which is uh a dream but i think a realistic dream I think you're exactly right, Evan, because what I just wrote in the chat, right? Like, okay, so say you try to, like, you know, for instance, not you, but let's say somebody in this chat room would want to become a facilitator and they would go take the state test and the state is like, no, you know, like you didn't have this qualification or we are only admitting 24 people in your county this year or whatever. And you're just like, well, I already got the stuff and I already know the people that I want to treat or sorry, not you, but this person who I would be speaking with would say, um, you know, I'm just going to treat Thanks, these people, <laughs> right? 
I'm just going to treat them like they're my, I'll just trip sit with them. And if they can help me get through my rent or whatever, you know, they're just going to do it. So if all the applicants who fail just go into business cheaper and more, more effectively than the professional realm, and we're dividing our competent people from the, the masses that need treated, it's just like, I, I see that there's going to have to be enforcement. They're going to have to be like, we need to let, stop letting people do this for free because we have the system they need to go through and we spent all this time building it. 100% agree with what you're saying, Evan, that it's just going to happen. People are just going to fucking realize how easy it is and do it themselves. And that's the excitement for me and you because we've had the you know transcendent experience and we're excited for it. That happens to so many other people. But, you know, people with agendas are trying to funnel these things in certain routes. Well, there is the question of danger for people that could have difficult experiences. It's true. I mean, not, not, not everyone's going to have a blissful time, and so the therapist won't have to do much. Some, some people could get suicidal. They may decide to, that they want to drive away, you know, regardless of what they promised before. So do you think that the professional model will just be okay because of like reputation and knowing that like that person's been checked out so people will be willing to pay the multiple? Well, I, I'm not sure. I have to think about it more. Yeah, I understand. I'll catch you at another one. Right. And, and you, you know, I mean, I, I completely agree with that. You know, I think that there's something to be said about training, especially for people who have you know, who are on medications or have conditions which might be at particular risk for, for you know, some of the possible, you know, harms that, 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 that can come with this type of stuff. Um, and I certainly think that there will be people willing to either pay a premium or try to get that covered by insurance for, for, for that sort of, you know, assurance that, that they know that the, the uh, facilitator is trained for, for that exact scenario. Yeah, Max, I agree with you. I think um, I th if it was me coming at it for the first time in, in like a legal setting, I would probably feel more comfortable at least the first time going to somebody who I knew had would be able to manage not just a difficult trip but or journey, but um, particularly contraindications or I mean, I know that I'm to my knowledge, I don't I'm not at risk of schizophrenia. I'm not bipolar. Um, but again, just making sure that it was physically safe. Um, and as somebody who wants to do this at, from on the other side as a therapist or a coach, it does scare me to think about what if I get in a situation where I can't, you know, where I have to call the paramedics because this person is actually like going into a seizure or something. And it's good to know that, um, Evan, you answered a question I had about whether or not mushrooms have a high incidence of issues like that because I'm a, I just finished a short um, show on Netflix called Unwell about ayahuasca and it scared the shit out of me <laughs> because like they had I don't know how common it is for people to have medical issues on ayahuasca but this one church in Orlando that I don't remember the name of but everybody's heard of um, you know they had somebody die there and granted he had physical issues that I guess didn't get screened out but um, even while they were there filming, a woman went into seizures and had to go to the hospital. So if, if mushrooms are not as dangerous that way, then that, that helps me feel better. But I do think that, I think a lot of people will feel more comfortable going to somebody who is more likely at least to have the coping mechanism for that. Yeah, and I would certainly just insert a quick, uh, it is my understanding that mushrooms are a lot less um, dangerous than ayahuasca if you if you are on SSRIs or other Western medication it's for those of us taking I think a spiritual approach there really is a fight if you put ayahuasca in a body that's got pharmaceuticals it can be really difficult and it's my understanding that kind of the worst that sometimes happens with with psilocybin is if you have SSRIs in and you put psilocybin in maybe nothing happens maybe you don't have trip but I'm unaware that there's any like contraindications other than letting people know, hey, you're going to waste your money if you take these now because, because of that, you know, situation. 
Yeah, my understanding is that with ayahuasca, it requires a monooxide inhibitor to, to actually make the, the DMT orally available. And this is where a lot of the negative, like a lot of the dangerous interactions occur is, is, is specifically with the, the MOAI. I was going to say, other people who haven't said anything maybe want to talk, even though maybe, was that you, John, you wanted to say something? In terms of, you know, distinguishing which medicines are going to reap the benefits that we seek uh, and mention the, the inhibitor that is required to. Um, and then another thing to consider is just the spirits that are involved with these plant medicines. Ayahuasca, the experience of, of taking that medicine, uh, it involves purging and, and still something to both of these different wisdoms, you know, Western medicine wisdom of, of how these things are supposed to affect people in order to this medicine is going to do for the bin. It doesn't have a lot of these, uh, at least negatively deemed um, factors like purging or lasting, you know, sometimes 48 hours. Um, and I, and I, I think that's why it's going to be able to affect the change that we believe it will with this measure. Thanks so much, uh, everyone, for, for joining the discussion, for watching Sam's presentation, and also for um, yeah, for asking such thoughtful questions. Thanks everyone for joining and I hope to see everyone again soon. Everyone Thanks for hosting this, Evan. Yes, thank you to, to Casbury and also thank you to you, Jay. Uh, sorry again to everyone for audio issues. I am living on a mountain. All good. All right. Bye, folks. See you guys next time. Bye.